As we say goodbye to the COP president, Alok Sharma, thank you very much. We invite Sadiq Khan, the mayor of London and the chair of the C40 Cities Group to, uh, to explain City's role in this transition. Thanks very much. Well, uh, good, good morning. I feel a bit uh, left out. I've not got a union flag um, <laughs> behind me. But, but good morning, uh, everyone. It's a pleasure to uh, be here today. What a lovely day it is outside. For those who are not from London, the sun always shines in London. <laughs> For those that are from London, it's the fourth day of sunshine, which means summer is over. <laughs> but can I say it's a pleasure to be here uh, today. Can, can I begin by, by thanking uh, Nick, not only for uh, his remarks this morning, but for all the vital work he and his colleagues at E3G are doing to help speed up the transition to a low carbon world. In fact, Nick, when I received the invite for this morning, Monday morning, uh, I assumed it'd just be you and I here. But it's lovely to see our city returning to uh, normality, uh, working from home uh, and hybrid working. I know it's a temptation on a nice day like this, but it's lovely that so many of you have made the effort to come out in person. I also must thank uh, E3G for helping us to stage this week of events, as well as to congratulate, as you heard from Mark Nick, uh, for being awarded uh, an, an OBE earlier uh, this month in the Queen's birthday honours for his services to tackling climate change and supporting the UK presidency of COP26. Please, let's show our appreciation for Nick and E3G for all their work. <laughs> Can also thank uh, our hosts, Mark and uh, Aviva Investors. Uh, we know that moving money uh, out of fossil fuels and into green and ethical investments is going to be key to overcoming this challenge. So I always wanna thank Aviva for showing us where you stand on this critical issue and for your advocacy and support for accelerating the shift to renewables. It is of course fantastic to be back in person at London Climate Action Week. After two years of this event being online due to the uh, pandemic, it's great that we're able to come together in person again and not be reminded three minutes into a speech we forgot to unmute and repeat the speech again uh, uh, for the second time. After um, two years, uh, it is fantastic uh, that we're here at the Aviva to kick off Climate Action Week, networking, exchanging insights and ideas, and building new coalitions around climate change is gonna be crucial to our success in addressing this problem. So I'm pleased we have the opportunity to meet face to face and to forge those important new connections. At the outset, I wanna pay tribute to all of you for the work you're doing in this area. Whether you're an investor or a climate campaigner, a researcher or a policy maker, a representative of a think tank or an employee of a green tech company, thank you. Thank you for your commitment and contribution to this cause. The climate emergency is without question the biggest threat we face today. It is existential in nature, threatening the health, welfare, well-being and security of every single citizen in the planet. Indeed, no country can wall itself off from the consequences of climate breakdown, from deadly heat waves in India and Argentina, to devastating wildfires in Greece and the USA, and from extreme weather events across continental Europe to record-breaking downpours and flash flooding in the UK and indeed in London. The last couple of years have uh, clearly illustrated that none of us can escape the cataclysm unscathed. The climate crisis will affect everyone, everywhere. And it will get much worse if we don't do more to curb our carbon emissions much faster, particularly for those in the global south who are already bearing the brunt of this man-made menace. This is why events like this one this week are so important, because not only do they help us raise awareness about the urgency of this challenge, 
but they also provide a space and forum where we can work together to develop the practical solutions we need to tackle it. I'm incredibly proud that so many of London's organizations are at the forefront of efforts to protect our environment, not just nationally, but globally too, from finding new and novel ways to decarbonize our economies and transport systems, to making breakthroughs in energy efficiency and helping to mobilize more investment in green projects and technologies. You're showing us the way forward and you're inspiring all of us to be bolder and more ambitious in our approach. As Mayor, I've made it my personal mission to ensure our city joins you and leads from the front in safeguarding our precious climate. Making sure we're not just talking the walk, but truly and literally walking the walk. So far, we've committed to making London a net zero carbon by 2030, 2030 faster than any comparable city. We've invested record sums in green jobs, skills and infrastructure as part of our Green New Deal for London. And we've set up plans to double the size of our green economy by the end of the decade. To help bring down emissions and clean up our city's toxic air, we've also delivered a five-fold increase in protected cycle lanes, put more electric and hydrogen-powered buses on our streets, and introduced one of the most far-reaching environmental initiatives anywhere in the world in the form of the ultra-low emission zone, the UZ. The ULES is currently four times the size of Paris, with plans now in train to expand the ULES to the whole of London, 15 times the size of Paris. But this isn't all we're doing, because through the C40 network of nearly 100 cities, which I'm extremely proud, as you've heard, to be chair, we're also spearheading global action that's helping to move the market towards renewables and low carbon technologies. This includes a major divestment push coordinated by and through the world's largest cities. So far, aiding cities are on board and we've divested more than $400 billion and invested them in the green economy. At an international level, COP26 did provide grounds for hope because it was the first time we saw at a UN climate meeting an extended debate on phasing out coal, oil, and gas. But we can't ignore the fact that the final wording was watered down with a reference to phasing out coal replaced with a commitment to, and I quote, phase down unabated coal power. Whilst this marks a step in the right direction, it doesn't go nearly far enough, especially when you consider the gravity and the immediacy of the threat we face. Rather than duck or delay action, we need to confront the reality that is a stranglehold that fossil fuels have on our economies. Early this month, early this month, the current UN Secretary General, Antonio Guterres, warned that fossil fuels have, and I quote, uh, humanity by the throat. And it's certainly the case that we need to break free from the damaging grip of fossil fuels and make a determined dash for renewables now, not later. And that's why I'm proud to announce today that London has signed the Fossil Fuel Non-Proliferation Treaty, a move which I hope will send an unequivocal signal uh, of our intention to confine fossil fuels to the dustbin of history. And this isn't just a symbolic act, however, because I can also announce today that as a city, we're following up this action straight away with the launch of Transport for London's Power Purchase Agreement tender. This is the first step towards TfL using 100% renewable power. It will help to catalyze investment into uh, uh, and build new renewable infrastructure. And once again, it shows that when it comes to climate action, cities are the doers, not the delayers. In our struggle to save the planet and preserve our civilization for future generations. Friends, let me end uh, by saying this. There's never been a more compelling case for ditching dirty fossil fuels and embracing clean, green energy. Not only is it necessary to ensuring our planet remains livable and for that matter, inhabitable, but investing in renewables will also reduce 
our dependence on autocratic regimes like Russia. Help us to tackle the spiral cost of living uh, caused by soaring energy prices. Enable us to address many of the inequalities and injustices exposed by the pandemic through a just transition and unleash a new era of sustainable growth with high quality green jobs on offer for our citizens. This is why going green is good for our security, good for our communities and good for our banks, businesses and economy. Put simply, it is the common sense option. Indeed, as the world stares down the barrel of a climate catastrophe, we just can't afford to stick with the status quo and replace one global public health crisis with another, the COVID crisis with an air quality crisis. The time for empty rhetoric and hollow gestures is over. The time for urgency and action is now. So ahead of COP27, let's resolve to continue doing our bit and continue to keep up the pressure on national governments because where we lead, I'm confident they'll be forced to follow. And that's because the prize that awaits if we grow back greener, as well as build back better, isn't simply a fairer, cleaner, less polluted London, but a stronger and more successful country and a greener, more prosperous and stable world. This is the vision we can and must continue chasing together. Thank you.